Hey everyone! Welcome to part 1 of the Flash Tools tutorial series for SideFX's Project Grot. In this video, we will build the foundational logic of our Flash Cluster tool. We will use curves to spawn placeholder rocks and shoot rays in all directions that will become Flash later on. Let's get into Houdini! Alright, here we are in Houdini and the first thing I always do is drop a geo node. And like with all of my tools, I first like to have some placeholder geometry. And in this case, what I'm looking for is something that will represent our environment, some surface with some rocks scattered on it. So in this case, I'm just gonna get a grid and increase the size, get a mountain node to add some interesting details on it, something like this. I'm gonna get a scatter and a line node to use as spawn points for some rocks. And for rocks, the platonic solid is gonna have to do for now. And I'm gonna get a copy to points node here and here. Mm -hmm. and then we can just merge all of that together. And that is our environment. Let's just get a null node and mark this for later. And for the curve, we can just get a curve node. In Unreal, we're gonna have a curve input. We can do all of this inside the editor. But yeah, but for now we can use this one. And to draw on the geometry, we can enable this primitive snapping over here on the left side. Just gonna start drawing here. Click, click, click. Okay, so that's a bit above the ground. I'm just gonna get a transform node and move it up by one meter. Then I'm gonna get another null node and call it in curve. And that is gonna do. In the original Flash Cluster tool that we've shown in our trailer, I used a slightly different technique that was closer to what I've shown in the Ruins tutorial series, where we first scatter a bunch of points and then we connect them all together and discard whatever is intersecting. However, at EPC 2024, during one of our workshops, Simon Restrete, our team lead, he has shown a really interesting alternative approach. He spawned the points on the rocks and then just shot them away from the rock using a ray cast. And I was really fascinated by this approach because it eliminates the two biggest problems that the tool had. The first one was speed, because as you can imagine, if we have a tiny scene like this, 10 by 10 meters, scattering a bunch of points on this is not really a problem. But if we expand this to, let's say 100 by 100 meters, you can imagine how as this scales up, it can become very slow. Whereas with a ray cast, the performance is more or less always the same because all it has to do is just shoot the same amount of points no matter what is around it. And the other thing is solving the intersections, which is also a really computationally intensive task. So basically you just kill two birds with one stone. I like this technique so much that I decided that I want to include this in this tutorial series because I think it's a much more elegant solution. To get there, first I need some placeholder rocks and I'm also going to just use the platonic solids again, but don't worry, we're going to replace this with something cooler looking later on. Um, but for now, I think an octahedron is gonna do. And I'm gonna get another copy to points node. Just get that in there. Alright. Okay. So even though I uh, told you to manage your expectations, of course, I still want to have some kind of variation going on, even though this is just the same simple mesh um, scattered all over the place. But what we can do, for instance, is we can change the orientation and scale of these platonic solids. The way that we can affect how objects are scaled and rotated and a bunch of other stuff is by modifying the points where we're gonna spawn them on. So for instance, if we want to change the orientation, we can randomize the normals. So right now there are no normals present on this mesh, as we can see if I enable or disable the normal display, it doesn't really make a difference. But I can add an attribute randomize node and type uh, the n attribute, the normal attribute, and we can see that now it has added some normals to our points. And when I go over to the options tab and um, play around with the seed, we can see that it randomizes the orientation. And if I go to my copy to points node, we can see the effect that it has. So the normal directly affects the orientation of the meshes that are being spawned on it. And it doesn't matter if it's a platonic solid or a realistic Megascans rock or whatever you want. And the other thing I would like to randomize is the scale. And we can just copy and paste this attribute randomize node. And instead of N, I'm gonna type in P scale. And we can immediately see the effect that it has. We don't really need three dimensions because P scale is just a scalar value. So we can just set it back to one so we avoid having wasteful attributes. 
And uh, I guess one thing I would like to do is set the minimum value to something a bit higher because we don't want to risk this reaching zero and then having a zero scaled rock. And what we can also do if we want to is we can on top of that add some multiplier. For instance, we could say add p scale equals add p scale times, and then I'm going to add a float parameter scale multiplier. So at the same time we have the randomization, but we also have this uniform scaling that we can add on top of that. And we can expose this later in our tool when we turn this into an HDA. But for now this is enough. Okay, so we have our rocks, and now I would like to implement the ray casting. So the first thing we need is we need some points. So let's just scatter some points on our rocks. And the next thing that we need is we need some normals because the normals will determine the direction where the raycast is being sent. So what we can do is we can get a normal node before our scatter. We can just use the standard settings. The cool thing about the scatter node is that it inherits all the attributes that are present on the underlying geometry. So in this case, it has just inherited the normals. And so now we can use our ray node. And the way the ray node works is it has two inputs. The first input is the points that we want to shoot in a direction. And the other one is the collision primitive. And we have it here, so we can just plug that in there and then see what happens. And I think you can see kind of what's going on. And it becomes more obvious when we uh, play around with this little scale parameter over here. So if I turn this down, we can see it's almost like an animation where we can see um, where we can see our points being shot into a direction. And as they reach a value of one, they they have collided with the primitive. So yeah, that's that's all that's going on. We have some points and they have a direction and then they fly and then they hit a surface. And the good thing is it solves a big problem for us already. And that is, well, where do the points go? And also we don't need to check for intersections because they would not intersect with anything. They just collide with the first primitive that they find and then they stop. So now all we have to do is we just have to connect the points where they ended up and where they used to be. And what we can do to, to get there is we can just merge our two uh, points together. And now we have them, now we have them both. And now we can, uh, we can connect them using an add node. So if you go over to polygons and then say by group, well, the first thing we're going to get is this this huge mess of a spline. And um, the standard behavior is just that it takes, you know, it starts at the first point and starts connecting it in one continuous paint by numbers until it's ended up in the last point. So we want a bit more control for that. There's this drop down menu here where we can define how they should connect. So in our case, we would want it to connect by attribute, but we don't have an attribute yet. So the attribute that I would like to determine which are allowed to connect is their point number. Because when we merge these two points together, the number that they used to have, um, well, it's going to change, right? Because now we have more points than there used to be. And the point number is always temporary. So even though we are technically working with the same points, as soon as we merge both of them together, their numbers are going to be mixed up and all over the place. But what we can do is we can store the number that they used to have using the enumerate node. So I'm just going to plug that in here and then connect it up. And I'm just going to call the attributes PT ID for point ID. And I'm going to change it to points and a string just in case because you never know. And if I go back to my add node uh, where it says attribute name, we can type PT ID. And now we have only the points connected that we want to where they started and where they ended. One thing we just have to make sure of is that um, the points that didn't get raycast, that we don't leave them here because it might cause some problems later on. So let's just get a fuse node, drop that here, and that should remove them. And just to be safe, we can type a very small value, should still get rid of the points, and keep our splines intact. And let's merge it together with all the other stuff. And that looks pretty cool. So I think you can see kind of where this is going, right? We basically have now a very solid foundation for 
for our flash cluster tool where we have some rocks that can move wherever they want and the cool thing is that the intersection problem is immediately solved even if we would have an environment that's 100 by 100 meters it does not affect the performance of our tool because again we only cast the rays that need to be cast so yeah that is basically it one last thing i want to touch on before we end this session so i'm sure one thing that's been on your mind is how damn straight all these connections are right but if you think about it it makes complete sense because the raycast is doing exactly what it's supposed to do we have a very perfectly flat surface and so of course the points will all be sent out in a perfectly parallel way but if we were to change the surface to something a bit more noisy it would also affect the rays being cast out so i'm just going to change that to show you the effect that that's going to have so i'm just going to get for instance a remesh node plug that in and then i'm going to get a mountain node and you can immediately see the visual impact that this has on our flesh cluster tool and i feel like just by making this minor change, it feels like we're already a huge step closer to the final end result. But the tech was already there. So just what I kind of want to tell you is that sometimes you already have the right tech set up, but maybe you need to work on the input. So yeah, it's, it's just really cool to see like if I set the amplitude to zero and then as I start increasing it, we can see the fibers, the rays getting messier and messier and messier. All right, so that was it for part one of the Flash Cluster Tools. In the next chapter, we're gonna add a fascinating algorithm called the Edge Bundling or Graph Bundling algorithm, which will really make our tool come alive. All right, I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.